much to my surprise, about two years ago, Pete wandered into the store unannounced, and uh, I knew that I knew I knew that I knew he was somebody I should know the moment that I saw him, but I couldn't quite uh, place who he was. And as soon as, as soon as we figured it out, uh, and that he divulged that he was now a resident of of our city in Chicago, I was so excited to hear that. So. Uh, And I think pretty much instantly we discovered that we had uh, quite a few symbiotic feelings about the percussion community and music education and drumming education. As a result, he and I have been trying to put a program together for almost that, uh, that entire length of time. And while I can't say it came together quickly or easily, I'm so glad that it finally did and that you all are here to experience it with us. To give a brief introduction to tonight's program, uh, we have uh, Columbia College audiovisual and film student Morgan Hammond. She's going to come up and explain to you a little bit about how the night is going to go. Come on up, Morgan. Okay, so hi everybody, my name is Morgan Hammond, and I'm just going to give you guys a brief rundown of what the clinic's going to be about, and a little bit of history on Pete Maganini, this uh, right over here. <laughs> um, so polyrhythms occur when two or more parallel meters, or polymeters, are played at the same time, sharing the same basic tempo. Then, when the polymeter itself is subdivided, those subdivisions become polyrhythms. Peter Magadini wrote the book Polyrhythms, The Musician's Guide in 1967. You can see it right on the right over on the stand there. As polyrhythms, the musician, oh, actually, it's now considered um, a classic among drummers and other musicians, and it's now in its 50th anniversary. So. <laughs> As Polyrhythms the Musician's Guide was written for all musicians interested in polyrhythms and their application, Polyrhythms for the Drum Set, as you can see on the left side of the stand over there, was Pete's second book on the topic and was written for drummers only and deals with the application of polyrhythms at the drum set. It was written in 1973. Both books focus on the fundamental building blocks of polyrhythms and polyrhythmic study. However, polyrhythms for the drum set also focuses on the four-way coordination between hands and feet, using the same basic concepts as the previously mentioned five fundamental polymeters. And this is where we're going to begin today's presentation. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Great job. To identify a polyrhythm or a, poly a polymeter, you have to have two events happening, okay? So one of these events I played on the cowbell. And this hand-to-hand -hand independence is not really what uh, these books are about, although this one, Polyrhythms for the Drum Set, does involve a fair amount of independence. And I'll get into that later. That, that book is covered mainly in the second half. The programs that you have, uh, the first half of this program is going to be based on the book itself. So I will refer to pages in the book and just play some of those and demonstrate some of those exercises so you can hear what they sound like. In the 60s, I... Uh, studied uh, Indian music with this this man right here and this is uh, Pandit uh, Mahapurush Misra and he happened to come to San Francisco with the Ali Akbar Khan uh, music ensemble and it was uh, 1966 that I studied with him and uh, it was quite an event. It happened uh, before the Ali Akbar Khan School. It actually happened at the University of California, Berkeley campus. And um, there was about, uh, there was hundreds of people interested in Indian music at the time because I think it had become kind of popular because of uh, uh, 
the Beatles connection with uh, Ravi Shankar. And I think people really like the sound of the drone is mainly what they were interested in. And in the Tabla class, there was about 40 of us. And in the end, there was of the six weeks or eight weeks we had, there was only uh, four of us left. Uh, myself, uh, John Bergamo, who became uh, head of the Cal Arts program in California. Uh, and then um, Vince Delgado, who has since uh, had a, 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 st a stunning career actually traveling with uh, Zakir Hussein in the Rhythm Experience playing in that, that uh, ensemble. So a very accomplished percussionist. And then, oddly enough, uh, uh, Richard Alpert, who became Ramdas. The instrument that's playing the rhythm that's the straight rhythm is just playing a, a, a popular melody that all Westerners know rather than an Indian rag. But normally there would be an Indian rag with a tabla drummer soloing on top. You'll hear. Dha dinna, dha dinna, dha dinna, dha dinna. One, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. you could imagine <laughs> we were blown away right a master like that playing the, you know at this level I had never never heard anybody do that quite this in the same way you know because the instruments complicated the music is complicated and it's not written down there's nothing really written down except the syllables and you've all heard Indian musicians recite those syllables those rhythmic syllables um, and that's a hard way to go when you're trying to learn how to play some of these things. So I got the idea that perhaps we could use our notation system to at least understand how those polyrhythms work. And you heard some stunning polyrhythmic uh, artistry right there. And uh, my idea was just to uh, give us a way to sort of transport ourselves into those into those into those worlds, and into those polymeters. Now, I had listened to some great jazz players who were playing polymetrically. Polymetrically, uh, one of them being Elvin Jones at the time, and uh, and there there were uh, some great drummers who were who were mastering this art, but we still didn't have a method to kind of get there. So this is what happened was. Uh, this book, the one you have in your hands. This one has a little different cover, but it's, it's the exact same book. And if you turn to page 10, I'm going to play that exercise at, on the top, just so you can hear the six, which is kind of the, the rhythm that works best. If you think of a chord of music, you have the tonic or the bass note, the, the root note, then you have the fifth, and in the middle you have the third. And this is, happens kind of like with the rhythm. Uh, we have the four-four is kind of the bass rhythm. 
the six is kind of like the third of a chord, and then the eighth is like the fifth or double time. All right, so some of these things um, will be technical, I suppose, but in order to be fair, before we get to the, you know, I have a band with me today, so hang in there. <laughs> before we get there, I think it's only fair to, to uh, a lot of the musicians here to play some of these uh, rhythmic exercises and etudes so you can just get an idea where I was coming from when I was writing this stuff. Now, this is not a drum book. Remember, it's a rhythm book, okay? So it's not necessary that you have to be a drummer to uh, understand how this works. Um, so uh, the click on this would be uh, 107. Do you have it there? One, two, three, four. So let's just jump over to page 10 for a moment. I will play that one. And this is the one with the neutral rhythm, and, uh, and 107 is, is cool, too. I'm giving Seamus the speed that I need to play. All right, let's stop just for a minute. So you don't have to have a time signature to have polyrhythms, right? You don't have to play in any certain time. Th this, this exercise in page 10, it doesn't have a time signature right? It's just either one to one or one and a half to one, all right? So it goes back and forth from the four four or that being one to one to the six over four. I'm going to show everybody how to play six and four at the same time right after this. We're all going to be polyrhythmic literate in just a few minutes, all right? Okay, so... as I promised. Um, pass the butter. Both hands on your leg. Pass. And then right, left, right. The butter. Pass the butter. Pass the butter. Together, right, left, right. Together, count six. Good. Now count to four. Good, excellent. You know, that, that's I'm impressed with that. Most people get uh, when they ask you to count to four, they get uh, kind of rhythm tied. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Right. So this rhythm that's in six, that can be subdivided into eighths, triplets, sixteenths. So can the four. You can play, it's also four against six, don't forget. They're polymetric, so you can, you can turn them upside down. T you know, the book subdivides a, a lot of these rhythms, and you know, later on we're gonna, at the end of the clinic, I'm gonna um, play one of the last pages in the book, so um, you'll understand the complexity of the stuff. But if you take it a page at a time and just go slowly, you'll find that your rhythmic bass will widen. And if, no matter what instrument you play, your feeling will, for rhythm will get wider. And rather thinking about rhythm right down the middle as to how close you can stick to the perfect beat, because your headlights are now fanned all over the highway, 
the lane you're in is much more comfortable because you can see all the other lanes around you. And not only that, if you want to go in one, you'll be able to do that as well. This is Freddie Cantero. And Manuel Reyes. Before you have polyrhythms, you have to understand a little bit about linear rhythms. And I find that a lot of articles I read and YouTube clips I see on, uh, on the internet, when they're talking about polyrhythms, a lot of the times they're talking about linear rhythms. Rhythms that are in the same time, but they cross the bar line. So the accents don't come, they don't come out in logical places. And that gets confused as being polyrhythmic. But to my mind, you can't have polyrhythms until you have polymeter. That you need to be in a polymeter before you actually have a polyrhythm. In this book, uh, this is sort of my drum set. Uh, this is what I've taught for the last 40 years as a drummer. Um, this is called uh, Learn to Play the Drum Set. Uh, all in one because it used to be two books and now they made it into one and um, these exercises I'm going to play you uh, are from this volume and I want to show you how they will morph into some polyrhythmic stuff by some of the linear stuff because we start thinking about it polyrhythmically. triplets one accent two doubles another linear triplet is when you play paradiddles when you play triplet as a paradiddle Um, so what happened there was I got into that room of that nice flowing jazz feel with the triplet in paradiddles, transferring it into my head as to three against four. Once I was in there, you can hear all the room that I can play with now. And that goes for any musician playing any instrument. Once you feel that other room happening with a polymeter, it gives you so much more freedom to improvise and, 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 and more depth to your playing. Even if you're just playing...
the depth you're looking for is going to be a lot deeper when you study these things. I promise you that. The next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, a beat that I have written in here. Uh, it's really uh, polyrhythmic. Uh, it has polyrhythmic roots. It's the Tower of Power groove that David Garibaldi came up with years and years ago. And it's at both double time, two to one, and one to one, at four four. And it goes like this. And it has those overlapped beats to it. Can be thought of as one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Ready? One, two, three. All right, so I'm going to get to one of the most important influences that I ever had playing drums, and that's um, through my entire career, my uh, limited knowledge but deep passion for African drumming and African, uh, African music. And the music that influences our drumming the most comes from West Africa, from the Awe tribe. And I'm going to play for you a composition um, called Egbeko. And Egbeko is, I'm playing just the part of the accompanying drummers because the Egbeko ensemble is playing all these different parts. And I'm only going to play a few of them. I just have two hands and two feet. Uh, there would be a, a solo drummer on top of all that improvising and stretching out. But we get, what we get and what we got in our music comes from these ensemble parts. I always ask my students to uh, check out this bell. It's called the Genkogui, or the Genk. And this is the rhythm that it plays for Egbeko. I don't have a rattle, but this is kind of the rattle part. And the hahatsi. The kiti and the kangar.
So here's number eight. Straight sixteenths with the flam on the first beat. Right hand flam. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Very simple. Straight ahead. We'll call it a rudiment. But wait till you hear how it sounds when the hands are separated and the bass drum is adding its own thing. Here is number 15. It's from the flam paradiddle family, but it's not right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Yes, there's a flam on every beat, but it's right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left. It sounds like this. And I'm going to end it with a uh, number 12. And this is uh, one of the few, uh, you know, there's about five of these on each page where you're playing a right, left, right, left with a flam on the first beat, right, left, right, left. And then you normally play another right, but then you come back and play a left hand flam. So you have right, left, right, left, and then you have to come back with a left hand flam. Page 16 and another eight pages of these things. Now, not everyone is gold. Some of these are, you know, uh, better sounding on the kit than others, but there's plenty of them that sound good. And I'm letting the bass drum do its own thing, and the hi-hat, once in a while, it opens and plays a little colorful splash here and there. Here we go. This is number 12, page 16. You can also syncopate these and give it the kind of a shuffly feel. I'll do number eight again with the syncopation. It's more or less a hip hop rap kind of feel, I think. That's how I'm identifying it anyway. So there you have it, Flam Beats, page 16, George Lawrence Stone. Whoever thought George Lawrence Stone was the purveyor of uh, hip drum beats with his Flam Beats that he wrote in the 30s sometime. Very cool because you can create with these and you know what, they're yours. They come out things that are come, come from you. It's not something you took off an, a record or an album or or a transcription somewhere, you know. I'm, firm, I'm a firm believer that you come up with your own stuff and it's much more solid, much more creative. And the guys in the band are gonna, you know, they're gonna notice that 
I don't care if it's a top professional band or, or your cover band. These things are cool and you're gonna have a, have a great time playing them and, and they're gonna make you a better drummer in a short amount of time. And that's what I think we're all looking for. I'm still looking for that. Okay guys, this is uh, Pete Magadini and I, I look forward to uh, the, next, the next one of these I do, but I really wanted to share this with you. Okay, take care. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. To learn them, you have to sort of be able to hear one, play the other, or count the other, play one, count the other, turn them upside down, in that each has the capability of going in its own direction. I'll show you what I mean. Okay, here we have six over four, six over four. We have the six divided into eighth notes, then into triplets, then into sixteenths. Let me demonstrate that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five over four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. in six is a rhythm that we don't have in Western notation. A rhythm that we don't have. 
You know, we have every kind of harmony you can think of, but that's a rhythm we don't have. It can only be gotten by going into the polyrhythm first. One, two, three, four, five, six, one into two into three into four into five into six into, and that's the triplet in six. basic pulse was that's where I was that, that's where I was coming from after a while you start hearing the six as the basic pulse and you start hearing the four as the polyrhythm well in essence you're right there too you know I start off I have a, a DVD uh, jazz drums and I, I start this DVD off with an African a way ensemble rhythm called uh, uh, Agbeko and it's played on a big iron bell. I don't have a big iron bell today, but I'm going to use the bell as a symbol. And really, this is just the ensemble part. These, this is the part of about four musicians playing under what the master drummer, the solo drummer, is playing. But check it out. Almost everything we play in our music comes from this. Tell me, is that polyrhythmic? You bet it is. And how old is that? I have no idea. Ancient. Long time ago. It's been going on for going on for a long, long time. Okay? We're just catching up. We're just catching up. Now, not all jazz brushes have to be in triplets with a circle motion. Uh, 
And instead of circling the brushes, this time the brushes go back and forth in a windshield wiper type effect in opposite directions. And what happens here is one brush hits and the other brush is coming down, it hits, then the next brush comes, hits, and hits. So we have dot, 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 dot. We have this eighth note sweeping effect going back and forth. And here's what it sounds like up tempo. Now there's many fine drummers who have many styles of playing brushes. The important thing about brush playing is that you, you find and discover your own style. So what I'm giving you here in example number eight is a basic pattern to follow. And when I teach brushes to my students, what I like them to do is just to have a basic pattern that they can play and rely on and then develop their own style and techniques off of that pattern. So what we have in example number eight is this. We start with the brushes on the outside on one and three and they cross over on two and four. So it's one, two, three, four. Now I'm going to add the hi-hat and the bass drum and I have kind of a semicircle, kind of an egg shape to my pattern. Not round but more of an oblong pattern. So, so the left hand is sweeping and the right hand is playing the ride cymbal part. Now if I want to play an accent with the left, for example, I'll play that accent and then the important thing is that I readjust my hands to get back into that pattern again. And at first this is a bit difficult, but with practice it becomes very automatic. You notice when I played the accent, I kept my right hand to the outside of the drum while the left hand played the accent and my right hand took over the sweeping part. And then I readjusted so it was back on the outside on one and three, on the inside on two and four. Some drummers play it just the opposite. This is the way I play it. Now when I'm playing an accent, what I'm trying to do is to get the brush to hit the rim and the head at the same time. So I get a popping sound. Now when you're playing brushes, you can also play on the cymbals just as you would with sticks. You don't always have to be on the snare drum. Also, when playing ballads with brushes, very slow tunes, I tend to like to pick the brushes up off the head once in a while and leave some space and use space as part of my sound. For example, The last thing I'd like to demonstrate with brushes is up-tempo. This is another challenging technique that takes perhaps more than 
a few years to <laughs> develop, but uh, it is possible, and I wanted to show you it's possible. So we're going to play a fast tune, and I'm going to stay on brushes for this. One, two, one, two.